Um, okay, so to make some introductions, uh, well, first, backing up half a step, I think most of you know that we've had a schedule change, and we we're talking about bison today rather than geology. So please turn to the orange tab. <coughs> and the reason for this change is because of the vehicle, the, the little Astro bus is needed tomorrow, and so that needs to go back this afternoon. And so we would not have an Astro bus to take you out to show you to do to do the full bison loop as the activity. And that's what we're going to do this afternoon, is once Jeff talks, we're going to go out and, and just show you what the activity for the bison loop, the hour and a half bison loop is like. Because you need to experience just that loop without the tour without the extraneous things that we did yesterday. So that was the reason for the change, was the vehicle. Um, some introductions need to be made, because we've got lots of visitors here today who are upset. <laughs> because they wanted to hear Haley talk about geology. But, you know, they're getting over it. Um, okay, so you guys remember Ken. You're <laughs> sitting up front. Uh, and we have Bobby Lutjohn here. And then we have Buzz Brazina, our 2017 docent of the year. <laughs> Circling around, we have Mary Brenneman. Okay. And then we have Retta Kramer. And have I missed anyone, Haley? Okay, then to introduce the docent trainees to you guys, we have Stan Guam over here, okay. Brad Williamson, Kelly Yarborough Frazier, like that. I didn't got all three. <laughs> <laughs> Kelly Pay or Carol Pacey. Right here. Uh, then we have ML Stahl. 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 Thank you. ML Stahl. Mary, or Mary Louise. Mary Louise. Or ML. <laughs> not Mary. Oh not thank you. Not Mary. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't like Mary. Okay, then we have Kathy Tuttle, Don Garwood, Forrest Chumley, Bill Bonk. And this is Jeff Taylor, but I'm not going to throw it over to you quite yet. We have a couple of other things that we need to address. So taking a look at our board. Okay. Uh, number one, Jill and Haley contact info. Uh, Haley and I have different email addresses. So if you're trying to get a hold of me, I'm Kanza Ed at ksu.edu. If you're trying to get a hold of Haley, she is keep ed at ksu.edu. Um, if you can imagine that we get each other's email things. Get confused, and so if I get emails from her, I just or her emails, I just forward them to her, and likewise, she forwards them to me. But we will give you this information at the beginning and work with what whatever happens from there. Our phone, we do have the same phone number. Is that the office phone? This is the office phone. This is the office phone. Uh, Oftentimes we're not there, we're outside doing things, so leave a message and we will try to get back to you. So there's contact information. Uh, yesterday we talked about the neon tower, and so let's take a look at your fact sheet. It's in the yellow reference section. <coughs> towards the back. It's the fourth document from the back. <laughs> so I would start at the back. Start at the very back. And work your way and just do this. It's the fourth document from the back. All right. 
So there's the explanation for the acronym, the National Ecological Observatory Network, what it is, a continental scale observatory made up of a collection of sites scattered across the United States. So what they're looking at, uh, impacts of climate change, impacts of land use change, invasive species ecology. Uh, the observatory consists of standardized equipment. So each one of the stations has much of the same tools, measuring much of the same things. Uh, spread across 20 eco-climatic domains. And the eco-climatic domains on the back page. This is, there are two on console. Uh, the domain that we are in is in the Prairie Peninsula. And so some of the things that they're measuring, you know, along with your typical weather, climactic measurements, they're measuring microorganisms, mosquitoes, ground beetles, deer mice, fish, birds, plants, aquatic invertebrates, biodiversity, population dynamics, phenology, infectious disease, biogeochemistry, microbial diversity and function, and ecohydrology. And then there's some more things on there. They have somebody who works there for They have quite a few people. people. Yeah, they, they have, uh, their office is in Manhattan, and they have, I don't know how many technicians, a bunch. They've got a bunch of technicians, and so they'll let us know when they're coming out and what they're going to be doing. But they typically have, uh, and you'll see them, they have white pickup trucks and now red pickup trucks. I'm see? going to and announce the grand prize winner <laughs> of the extremely nice the Cadillac. So. Yeah. With, and it will say neon on the side of, of the truck. And so they'll be doing all kinds of things. So when you're out here, don't be surprised to see the, the neon trucks. And I believe that there is, yeah, okay, so website resources on the very back. It has a couple of emails or a couple of um, website links there. So if you wanted to find out more, you could. Do we do any other like this on the tours? Or? No, because uh, the, the kids don't, well, I talk about them down at the nature trail when we have nature trail hikes. Because they're like, what's that? Do we get to climb that? Mm -hmm. um, and so I'll give them a brief overview. But it, a lot of this is kind of beyond their yeah. scope of understanding. And the one up on the high prairie the kids don't see, yeah. not unless they're walking the six mile trail. Mm -hmm. And that's not gonna be with us, so. So no, we really don't. They do have a large body of data and they do have an educator. Um, they, there is the ability to partner with that, but it's still quite new and the uh, educational aspects is still <coughs> developing. Mm -hmm. this, the neon towers have been here for about a year now. Well, the, the Agco one, for the year, the one from here too, so for that one, it's been a little while. I'm just trying, time is relative, right? How much does the relocatable one get moved around? It has not yet. It, it's not like the monthly thing. It'd be like once a decade, probably. Once no, a decade. It's not all the time. Yeah. I think relocatable is, yeah. in quotes. Yeah. yeah. So it's 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 pretty well there. All right. Okay, so that's neon. Um, okay, so what we're going to do today, again, we're flexible. We roll with things. We're going to have Jeff Taylor, the manager of the Bison Herd, and also our our uh, resident expert for the botany of Ponce Prairie. Mm -hmm has just finished putting together the comprehensive list of vascular and non-vascular vascular plants, vascular plants of Tanza. And which is interesting because the last time this was done, uh, there was a little over 500 and now we're over 600 species. Do you have a total of 600? 600. The finishes in quotation. Right? Yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> we're using a lot of quotes today. 680. <laughs> So that's something that will be coming to you once it gets completed and he's ready to release it to the mass. Um, a do new we list. have to memorize that as part of our Yes, you do. <laughs> 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 
with the, with the scientific names and put them in taxonomic order. <laughs> So is the increase in species due to more observation or due to taxonomous splitting? No, but there's a third reason. There's a third reason too. There's more invasive species. That's the question that's asked. That's the third, yeah. What's the third reason? Yeah. 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 So, um, switching to our main topic for today is bison, and we will be talking with Jeff, and we have a PowerPoint presentation, and then his daughter Lily, who is adorable, and uh, will be giving us a PowerPoint presentation and answering lots of questions. Um, and then once after our break, we're going to get back in the bus and we're going to go out and do a bison loop tour, just like we would with the kids. And you're all going to learn how to open and close the gates properly. Yep, so that, that will be today. So any questions so far? All right, then I'm going to pass this over. Jeff Taylor, there he is, manager of the KPBS Bison Herd and resident botanical Nazi. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, he's the one who lets me know when I get things wrong. <laughs> I'm not sure how to work this fancy thing. Okay. So this can be it. No, I'm just reasserting a couple times. Or do you have two? Do you have two? Two ports? Oh, it's coming.
No, it's just it's not saved on your device. Yeah. Here. What else do you have on there? Nothing. This work. is the DGA. My, my computer does have a DGA for it. So it's fine. You see, this isn't getting any power here. Mm -hmm. With this new, this new there's no. That's just power. Right, because there's no, there's no ports. Yeah, I think Apple outsmarted themselves on that one. They did. See if I did. And this one wasn't being read either. It was not, but it, but you know it wasn't. You know what we can do? Can do Just download this onto here. How do you do that? Oh, so, yeah. Since you can't see it. I have, I have another, I have another app. Just and so we can just download it on yeah. here. Yeah. Pardon me? You know it to you. No, no I can. Get around it, you What's it? <coughs> so, 10 bags. So they've got a USB connected by their wireless or something? Uh, no, it's the new, the new Apple loop. They only have one port. Right. Everything goes out through your power port. Which was pretty incredibly stupid in my opinion. But I don't know. I was going to see how for 36 years. I had another one. Computer out. My computer, yeah. My computer directly to the projector. Yes, you do not. You love computers. Aha! Supposed to be about prairie bison, the role of bison in prairie management. But uh, I'm trying to think of the information you guys need given to us. So we're going to try to hit the basics, starting with bison history, um, where they come from, who they are, what they do. So we'll have some context. Then we'll talk about how they interact with the environment. That would be the, their role in the environment um, and how the community responds around them. Then, since cattle have replaced bison, uh, throughout most of North America. We'll talk about how they compare and whether they're equivalent or not on the landscape. And then we'll get into some details about the cons of herd. So uh, bison belong in the same family as cattle. And you'll hear people call them buffalo, which is generally acceptable, but it's not true. So this is this uh, cladogram, I guess, here, um, is the cow tribe, bovine within the, the cow family. And you notice the true buffalo are not really related to our modern bison very closely. They diverged about five million years ago. 
So, so bison are more closely related to cattle and yaks than they are to buffalo. Buffalo being you know, African water, uh, African buffalo, kid buffalo, they belong in the genus Bugalus. Uh, and then bison, they diverged from what led to cattle about two million years ago in Eurasia. So the, not the first bison species, but one of the most widespread in history was bison priscus with the stem bison. And it was widespread across Eurasia, and then starting about half a million years ago, it began to spread across the Bering Land Bridge and invade North America. And that didn't happen one time, it happened several times throughout history. And then once in North America, well, the ones that stayed in Europe, you eventually are left with the European bison, bison bonassus, which there's not many of them left, but there are some in Poland. And then the ones that lived in North America, you basically have a direct lineage from bison priscus through latter fronts, and take you and talus down to our modern bison. Um, and this isn't as simple as it looks. So our modern bison are, they first showed up only about 10,000 years ago, so they're fairly recent. Mm. So uh, this is sort of a timeline showing when the different species were present in North America. So bison priscus has been around for two million years at least, uh, showed up in North America 500,000 years ago, about, about the beginning of the timeline there. And there was a lot of overlap, so there was a lot of crossbreeding and genetic mixing there, so it's not this simple direct linkage. Um, and you'll see that our modern bison at the bottom are, are very, very recent compared to the long history of bison in North America. And I guess an interesting takeaway from this, or, or an interesting connection to make, is that bison as a genus in North America developed, I guess we, could be included in what we call the Pleistocene megafauna. <coughs> that included things like horses, camels, saga antelope, giant ground sloths, mammoth mastodons, all those things lived here in North America and would have been competitors for bison as they evolved here. Mm -hmm. Now these are the competitors. They also had to put up with lions and cheetahs and short-faced bears and saber-toothed tigers and straight out of Fenaria, the dire wolf, right? Um, so this is the, the, the history, the conditions that these animals had to put up with as they evolved. You know, bison ladder fronds and antiquous were twice the size of our normal, our, of our current bison, up to 4,000 pounds. And you can imagine why they had to be running around with the saber-toothed tigers. The other interesting thing to note is that there's this turnover. Right at the end of the Pleistocene, we had this major extinction event where all of these uh, Pleistocene megafauna, including these big bison, uh, either went extinct or were extirpated. So North America lost 75% of its megafauna. And that happened not just in North America, in most places in the world. And emerging from the rubble, right at the end of this time period, is the modern bison. So they emerged at this time when there was very little competition, and the predators were a heck of a lot wimpier. And it allowed them to rapidly expand the range and become super dominant on the landscape. Uh, so this is the, what is thought to be their range map, their original range. The orange up there is the wood bison, bison bison Athabasci, and then the darker brownish color is our plains bison that we have here. Obviously 30 to 60 million bison is a lot of bison, and they would have been a dominant force on the landscape. Uh, and while they existed in the eastern woodlands and mountain meadows and things, they were most dominant, most abundant on the western plains, the short grass and mixed grass prairies. And we're right on the edge of that. We probably didn't have these herds that were hundreds of thousands strong running through here all the time. <coughs> so everybody, could you repeat that for what? So right, we're on the edge of the mixed grass prairie. Here we probably had smaller groups of bison that were residents. <clears throat> and the occasional mega herd coming through. But those, you know, the, the pioneer stories about herds crop, taking three days to cross the trail, that was way far less than the short grass prairies. Mm -hmm. And then we all know the story of their decline. The economic forces of the world almost left them extinct. There were less than 300 bison left in the U.S. by 1900. At that time, a few conservation minded ranchers rounded them up and started breeding them. And they made a modest comeback. There are about half a million in North America right now, 30,000 of which are on public lands, and the rest are private herds like Kansas. So, uh, just some basics about what, what they are, what they look like, what they can do. The bulls are big, 
They, they weigh about 1,800 pounds. We've had some here that were up to 2,000. In some other places in the country, they get to 2,000 regularly. Uh, females here average about 1,000 pounds or a little less. And newborn calves are 40 to 60 pounds at birth. And in their first summer, they can gain 250 pounds on average. Some of them up to 400 pounds if, if they're having a good year. So, so they can run fast. They can jump high. They have sharp horns. So don't do anything stupid when you're out there. You guys will be out there in the bison area. Make sure you pay attention because they can be dangerous. They look like a big cow, but they don't act like cows. Um, so when you're out there, you'll notice that most of the time the bulls are separate from the herd, at least the mature bulls. You'll find bulls by themselves or in groups of up to a dozen. We call that the bachelor herd. And then the cows and calves and young bulls um, will typically be in larger groups spread out around the pasture. When rut starts, breeding season starts, the bulls will move into the herd. This will be late July, August. Um, and they will start to tend the females who are coming into estrus. They can use their bonero nasal organ, Jacobson's organ, that's what that bull in the top picture is doing. He's testing the air for pheromones to see if any of those cows are ready. And when he senses that a cow is going to be ready, he will follow her around all day and try to keep her away from other bulls and guard her movements all day long until she's ready. We call it tending, or tend to his females. Uh, after breeding is done, nine and a half months later, typically in the middle of April or early May, we have a calf. This is timed so that there's food to eat for the mother so that she is able to make milk. Lactation is metabolically expensive and they need to have the food to make it happen. It just doesn't work. Um, so timing this right means a healthier calf and a calf that's more likely to survive the following answer. So, frequency of twins. Is there a frequency of twins? No. Nope. I've heard of one report in all of history of twins at a zoo a hundred years ago. So this never happened here. It, it's extremely rare. Uh, an important thing to remember throughout the rest of this talk in understanding how bison work and what they do is that they eat grass. They eat plants. And plant tissues are very hard to digest. So they are ruminants. Do you guys know what a ruminant is? <coughs> it has a, a four-chambered stomach. So bison employ a host of microbes that live in their foregut that help them digest plant materials because they can't do it on their own. And, and two, I guess, bison need a lot of things to survive, uh, but two major components that are very important are nitrogen and carbon, or proteins and carbohydrates or energy. And it's important for bison, bison obviously need nitrogen or protein to grow, but the microbes that live in a bison's gut have to have protein, have to have nitrogen in order to break down the plant tissues. If they don't have enough nitrogen, they can't digest the plant tissues, and therefore the bison doesn't get fed. It's the microbes that feed the bison. The bison feed the microbes, and the microbes feed the bison. Okay? So nitrogen is extremely important, and bison habits and behaviors are centered around finding the highest quality forage. The, the forage with the most foliar nitrogen, the highest crude protein. Okay? So what's left in their poop? <laughs> this un came un up yesterday. Undigested plant fibers, not nitrogen that they couldn't extract. Same okay. stuff as snars. How does the uh, stomach biota compare between cattle and bison? There's an interesting paper on that, actually. I could look it up for you. They're pretty similar. There are a few, uh, I can't remember if they're my uh, bacterial species or protozoan species that, at least during that study, were found only in bison, not in cattle. But you know, the okay. overall, overall function is the same. I could look at the paper if you're curious. Okay. No. It is mostly what is left cellulose? A lot of it's undigestible cellulose, yeah. I was thinking about lignin, and when we got to talking about burning the buffalo chips, I wondered mm -hmm. if it was enriched in lignin. There is, yeah, I mean, especially <coughs> later in the year. So there's an easy way to test what forage quality is like out there. We call it the pile high method. Uh -huh. The height of the pies tells you how, how good the uh, forage is. So this time of year, the piles will stand up, and on a frozen morning, if you hit one with your truck, it'll about tip your truck over, right? <laughs> But in uh, <coughs> six or eight weeks, you go out there and see a bison lifting its tail, and you better stand back and you get splattered, right? Because the forage is really, really good. There's almost no lignin or uh, complex structure of carbohydrates that are break down, so they can digest it really easily. 
Right now, yeah, they, they can, it's barely digestible. There's no nitrogen in it, it's all lignin. There's just, it's no good, they're losing weight. Do, do you supplement salt and minerals at all? Yes, they have free access to salt and mineral. But that's all the stuff, but they don't receive supplemental feed. So, um, so bison are big, they, they cause a big impact on the landscape. Uh, and the ways they do that are by altering the physical and chemical environment which changes resource availability and eventually leads to heterogeneity, differences across the landscape and create a habitat mosaic, a patchwork of different habitat type, types and structures that uh, allow for other, allow opportunities for other <coughs> taxa to live. So some of the physical alterations, I mean the most obvious is that they graze. So without grazers, the tall, warm season grasses become super dominant. You guys went out of the tour yesterday, is that right? You look at 1D, it's all grass. Big blue stem Indian grass and almost nothing else, right? But, newsflash, bison eat the grass. And when the grass is gone, it opens the door for other plant species to live. So having higher richness of plant diversity means that other animals that need different uh, food crops can, can live there. And it also changes the structure, the physical structure, having tall forbs, short grasses, and so on and so forth, means that there's more habitat available for different kinds of living things. So this is just data from comments that shows what I said. In the grays area, that's the lighter blue down here, there is lower grass cover across time, and ungrazed, higher grass cover. So as a result, in the ungrazed area, you have lower forb cover there, and higher forb cover in the grays and species richness, that's just number of species per area. <coughs> Higher grazed grades. So uh, removing the grass also affects the microclimate, just the climatic conditions that things living there were experienced. The loss of the grass biomass removes the buffer in the soil, so soil temperature and air temperature at the surface are higher, so more is usually lower and it's usually windier. So there's no grass to, to buffer the soil. So obviously things that live there have to experience that. And some things uh, specialize in that kind of habitat and they don't live anywhere else. They also physically alter the environment by creating trails and wallows. I'm sure you all saw wallows yesterday. They roll in the ground, cause it dirt, make it shallow, bare depression with no plants in it. And in the summer, or in the spring, when it rains a lot, these things fill up with water. And the bison will drink out of them, and so will other wildlife. And it also creates habitat for breeding frogs. On a wet spring, you can go up there and see tadpoles mm -hmm. that reproduce on the uplands, away from streams and ponds and creeks. It also is habitat for aquatic plants. So you can find things that you find in the Kansas River or down in these low ponds and creeks, you can find growing on the tops of hills in these wallows. But then later on in the summer, they'll dry up and they'll bake, and you get xerophytes, things that can't grow anywhere else except where the soil is hard and dry and hot. So they are important as well. So it's a basic way that bison alter the chemical environment is that they increase rates of nutrient cycling, especially nitrogen. Um, and it's important because nitrogen is limiting, a limiting factor in plant productivity and also in forage quality for bison and other animals. So they, they convert nitrogen through and redeposit it in more uh, labile, easily accessible forms, food down the urine and carcasses. So we don't typically remove bison from the area if they die, unless they're in a bad spot or they seem to be diseased. Uh, so that, it, it changes nitrogen availability to the soil and the plants. It also means when they eat grass, we burn less nitrogen off, and the litter is of higher quality, although it's a lower amount. So the result is that nitrogen is more available to plants for bison and grazing. So with 4% losses on average, how many carcasses are out there every year? How many are added every year? What <laughs> Several. Is it? Several? 4% 4, 4 that would be 10 to 12. How long does it take for them to decompose? Will we see them out there? Will we see them? Well, if, if they die in a spot that you go, okay. sometimes, <laughs> sometimes you never find them until you see some bones when you're out on a burn, you know? It's a big place. And they typically, unless they get struck by lightning or something, they, they typically don't make it up out of where they're getting water very far, so they're down in the creeks. You try, I guess you recover the ear tags if you... If we see them, yeah. yeah. Otherwise, I just notice that they're missing a letter. So. 
you mentioned lightning. Have you had any major lightning strikes that have taken down lightning? Yep. Yep, it happened. <laughs> It hasn't happened in a few years now, but it does happen. Yeah, there was one that was called Sparky, right? That no, Gene had one <laughs> called Lucky Strike. Lucky Strike. Lucky Strike. Lucky Strike. Yeah. It lived. That one lived. Lived, yeah. So he had two cannulated bison, so he could do his, his paper on the gut mic of Vita, and uh, so he was sampling their rumens. And I think one of them, I can't remember what happened to one of them. It died somehow, and the other one got struck by lightning. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody doesn't like your experiment. Yeah, I guess not. <coughs> so have you guys talked about the three main drivers of tall grass prairie fire climate grazing? Mm -hmm. Grazing is affected by all three of these. So the effects of bison grazing vary temporarily and spatially, and they're affected by our three main drivers, including grazing itself. So uh, fire and grazing interact because burning increases soil nitrogen availability. When you don't burn, these soil microbes decompose the litter, and they bind up a lot of the nitrogen in breaking down all the carbon in the plant tissues. So this nitrogen, it tends to build up in the system, but it is unavailable to plants because it's all tied up in the microbes that are digesting plant litter. When you burn, you remove all that carbon, and a lot of the microbes die because they no longer have a food source, and all that nitrogen is released into the soil, and plants can take it up. This is especially pronounced in somewhere in a, in a place that hasn't been burned in a long time, and then you burn it again. So watch this year where our four-year burn is, N4C. That's where the bison will spend most of their time, especially in early spring. Um, so the increased nitrogen in plant tissues means higher forage quality, and that means the bison are going to spend time there because it's good food. Now, the same interaction grazing and fire, but working the other way. When bison graze in the place a lot, they decrease the grass biomass, and they decrease the fire effectiveness, which means it creates refugia for fire-sensitive species that, that no, normally wouldn't grow there, like cool-season graminoids and woody plants or winter annual forbs, things like that. <coughs> now, grazing can affect grazing. So um, there are two concepts here. I guess. Because of these feedback loops, bison tend to form these grazing blocks. And it happens because increased grazing pressure creates greater nitrogen availability, like we discussed. And that leads to higher forage quality. When there's high forage quality, the bison graze. So you get this feedback loop where you get this lawn, this, this patch of ground where the bison just hammer it hard and graze it to the dirt all the time because it's good. And they never want to quit. But at the same time, because increased grazing pressure leads to higher forage abundance and lower fire effectiveness. It leads to decreased palatability and therefore decreased grazing pressure. So these two sort of feedbacks are tied together and uh, they're in some sort of balance. These grazing lawns, if you watch them over time, they move around. Some of them get abandoned, and this is why. Most mm -hmm. of the uplands around the bison fence is some form of, form of grazing lawn. So when people take tours, anybody that watches pastures and, and knows anything about grazing cattle will tell us that we're overgrazed with it. And they're absolutely right, but we're not overstocked. It's just a, a, the nature of the beast. The only way to stop overgrazing in reality is to uh, rotate pastures. Some of the, I said that the, a buffalo is better for grazing than a cow because they're closer to the ground. Or? We'll get, we'll get, get there. To that. Okay. Yeah. Better is a subjective term, right? Okay. <laughs> So climate can also affect grazing. Uh, climate affects plant growth, which changes forage quality and forage availability. Typically, in a high rainfall year, you get high grass productivity in the grasses here when they are highly productive, have a lot of lignin and structured carbohydrates, and a low nitrogen to carbon ratio, which means they're not very digestible and they're of low quality. In a low rainfall year, as long as it's not too low, then you get low productivity and high quality forage. If it's too low, then the forage is not available when you run into other problems. And this happens on a year-to-year -year basis, but it can also be important within the year. There was a study in 2009 that showed midsummer precipitation. If you have a lot of midsummer precipitation, then bison don't do as well. That's because the rain is coming at a time when the grass is needed, and if they get it then, then they grow a lot, and they flower, and the forage quality goes down. But late summer precipitation, that would be mostly August, I think, uh, when you get a lot there, it keeps the grass growing so forage is available later in the year and buy some better. 
So because of these, these feedbacks and interactions are, uh, the impacts of bison grazing are highly variable in space and time and in magnitude. Because these things happen differently in time and space, um, it creates this habitat heterogeneity, which I talked about, and the effects of that heterogeneity cascade through the system. This is some of the things we found on comms that I haven't got data to show this because I didn't want to spend time on it, but maybe somebody else will tell you about it. We get increased grassland density, which is diversity, increased deer mice abundance, altered grassland bird abundances, and uh, potential for a deer and a frog breeding out there. So with all that in mind, what is the bison's role on the landscape? <coughs> the heterogeneity creators, right? The, the biodiversity promoters. They are what we call a keystone species. Mm -hmm. And that's a species whose presence on the landscape creates a disproportionately large impact. Uh, and I think it's arguably true of bison, that without them, things are totally different. And less diverse. So what about cattle? There were 60 million cattle or 60 million bison, potentially, in North America pre-settlement. Right now there are 95 million cattle in the country. Not all of those are in pasture. But do they have the same impact? What people tend to do is they look at the bison and they put him up here on the pedestal. 